we have an event loop. Uh, so it's going to call update and it's going to call draw uh, at maybe 60 times a second. Uh, update has to has the responsibility of uh, you know updating all of the game logic, and draw has the responsibility of drawing it to the screen. Um, <coughs> So the first thing that many game engines do, and this includes other games engines in Python like um, Piglet, um, Pygame Zero, which is my educational game framework, and Wasabi 2D, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, they will absorb the event loop. And they'll just give you, a, you have a hard-coded event loop, and we just have a function called run. Um, that is, you know, there's some way of passing update and draw into it, whatever. Um, and then the next optimization, or well, the next uh, advancement in, in structure here is to have an object called a scene graph. And a scene graph is going to be a data structure um, that represents what is drawn. And the engine can handle drawing that. So it can uh, build in considerations like make it pretty or uh, don't draw what isn't visible in order to go as fast as possible. Um, an update, of course, is still going to uh, run 60 times a second, but it's, its responsibility is now to make those changes into the scene graph uh, to be drawn when a draw happens. So from this point forward, we're going to talk, we're, we're not going to talk about graphics in a game, we're just going to assume a scene graph exists. Um, so now I want to take a little look at the state of the art for concurrency in games. Um, I've got a bit of video here. So in this game, I'm moving lots of objects. They are all moving it in at the same time. Um, you could easily see how this could be written as one function um, and maybe vectorized. And that view is always going to be useful. That's going to be that's possibly a, a faster way of uh, animating many objects at the same time. But if you look at a different example where uh, you have two actors in the game that are uh, doing completely independent behaviors. This is much more easy to see as, uh, as, as two tasks, two, two sets of behaviors that just happen to exist within the same game engine and uh, you know, uh, the same game loop. Um, if we look at uh, the logic for, uh, for the update function world, um, there are lots of problems with this. So it's messy. There are lots of state variables. Um, this function even gets called when there's no work to do, so there's an early return at the top. And this is, it's hard to refactor because it's all woven together. If we look at a coroutine-based version, um, things get a lot simpler. So uh, the coroutine syntax in Python is if you have an await, you are... Uh, pausing, suspending the execution, and you'll be resumed later. So we're delegating back to the, uh, the, the event loop, the game loop. Um, but lots of things drop out of this. So the current state of a task is captured by local variables um, and the position in the coroutine function. Um, and a coroutine function now has a much bigger slice of an object's behavior. Um, uh, so you, know, you can see a behavior end-to-end -end within a function. Uh, this is a full example from Wasabi 2D, so I'm going to walk you through this briefly. Where the scene object is the scene graph, uh, then random position is a function that just returns a random position within the screen. That's obviously a sync function. And then drive ship is an async function. Um, it's going to create a ship sprite at a random position, position and then forever it will pick a new random position. And then over time, it will turn the ship to face that. And then over time, it will move it to, to the next position. And then we pass that coroutine into the run function in order to, uh, you know, to run that as our game. That, that coroutine becomes our game. Uh, looking, taking a, a look around the, uh, the world of game engines, uh, Unity has support for coroutines. Um, and this is what it looks like in, in Unity. Uh, but this is quite limited. Um, it, like it has a limited capability, 
um, and the syntax is quite clumsy. Like this is this is apparently C sharp's state of the the art for co uh, for generators. So they're still at the phase of using generators as coroutines. Um, another example from the world of UI. In fact, like JavaScript, you would expect it's all, it's doing a lot of UI. So there would be lots of these frameworks. And actually, this is the only one that I could find that is find that is using uh, coroutines in order to do uh, animations on screen. Uh, so uh, Python has you know superb coroutine uh, support, um, and uh, you know let's go use it. Um, another example: uh, if you have um, children, perhaps, um, or you are a child, uh, this is code from a, a programming language called Scratch, a graphical programming language, and it has forever loops, and it doesn't have a break. So you know, naively, this would run forever. This would just hang. But this is where you, you do animation in Scratch. You, you do a forever loop. So there is an implicit yield somewhere in there, in, a, in fact, in a few pla places. So now we come on to the, the, the meat of this talk, which is structured concurrency. So we've seen concurrency. We've seen the ability to run tasks that delegate to the event loop. What is structured concurrency? Well, uh, I'm going to steal a... Uh, quote from Nathaniel Smith, who is the author of Trio. Uh, Here's the core idea. Every time our control path splits into multiple concurrent paths, we want to make sure that they join up again. And uh, I'm also going to steal Nathaniel's slide. Um, <laughs> the, the green task is, uh, so it's a task that's running. It starts doing something concurrently. And then all of those tasks must finish before the green task can continue running. But we can look at that in code. Uh, this is the code from Trio. And so imagine you have a fetch function that's uh, fetching a remote URL or something. Um, we have an async with block that is opening a nursery. And the nursery is the scope in which we can start more tasks. Um, and the exit of the async with block is the point at which we wait for those tasks to complete. So. Unfortunately, in Python, we don't, it's, it's a really important point, a really important await point, and unfortunately, it's just indicated by that dedent. So keep your eyes peeled for that because it's going to be crucially important. Um, so we await both tasks at the dedent of that block, and then we can compare. Um, you could contrast this to what we can do with async IO today. Um, it looks superficially quite similar, but there is there are a few differences. So first, you can with async IO, you can still create tasks outside of a gather. So you could, at any point, create a disowned task that survives a function. And in fact, the way that I've written this, uh, those the tasks that are created, uh, if you moved one of those outside of the, the gather, it would still be a, a task that is running. Um, you can also pass coroutine functions into gather, and then the task is, uh, uh, you don't have the task object. But, um, you can't pass the gather around object around, and you can't add more things to it. Um, but more deeply, there's no concept of ownership here. So um, if one of the tasks uh, raises an exception, then the, that, the exception will be raised here immediately, but the other task will continue running. Uh, this isn't bound together. Um, in Wasabi 2D, uh, you'll see code that is super similar to Trio. Um, some things are spelled differently. We embrace coroutine objects, um, but you know the the behavior is exactly the same. And uh, coming in Python 3.11, there's task group, and it looks <laughs> super similar to Wasabi 2D. So um, uh, if in in async IO and task groups in Python 3.11, if you are only using task groups, then yeah, you're doing structured concurrency. Um, there are you know it's not going to enforce that you are only using task groups. Um, and I still think like Trio has more power. It's, it's further along in its adoption of this model. Um, so the, the fact that we can only start tasks through a nursery, and we have had to enter that nursery before we could do it, means that we can construct a, a tree of the, the tasks. We, there, is, there is logically a tree um, by which tasks are connected to one another. And this, this tree could go deeper than this. So we don't need to know what DriveShip is doing, but if, if that was uh, running tasks, then this tree would be deep. 
Um, so we have to bear in mind that, that there's a, a tree structure behind this because that's going to come in. Uh, that's going to be important later. So let's look at a few examples of why structured concurrency is useful in games. Um, and to do this, I am uh, using a game that I wrote for Pi Week in September last year, Pi Week 32. Uh, the theme was never ending. So it's, a, it's gonna have an, a never ending succession of waves uh, of enemy ships uh, approaching and I'm uh, flying around and shooting at them and uh, uh, that's a little bit sped up. So how do we do an infinite progression of waves? Um, in this code, um, uh, itertools.count will loop forever and it's just gonna count up and at the start of each wave, let's pause for a moment in order to let the player get into position. I say pause, I mean like sleep this coroutine. Uh, the player will still be moving. And then we start a nursery and we can spawn enemy ships into it. The enemy ships were called Threx, so that's why it's <laughs> that's the odd naming of that function. Um, and the nursery isn't going to exit until all of those ships are dead, uh, which is why we can write it like this. Um, but something that surprised me as I was adopting this in writing games is that um, it was really natural to use uh, nurseries to decompose the behaviors of, ship, of sh a ship or any game object into a bundle of tasks. Um, so most of them are defined as closures in this function. That was, uh, if in Pi Week, you write code quickly, um, but you know your style preferences may vary. Um, but there's a benefit here, which is that we can really easily share behaviors between game objects, and not by inheritance, but by running their behaviors as part of our nursery on, on our game object. Um, but the behaviors individually become easy to write. Um, th like this is a compelling thing that in the top example here, um, we're waiting for input. Oh yeah, you can wait for input. So we're waiting for the uh, controller button to be pressed. And at the moment that the button is pressed, we create a bullet object. Um, and then we sleep, which puts a limit on the, the maximum speed at which the player can press the button to shoot. Um, and something else to note is that we're spawning the bullet into an outer nursery, so it's, its lifetime isn't coupled to the lifetime of the ship. Uh, in the bottom example, it's, I'm just sort of illustrating how uh, this could be refactored. So uh, this is the kind of model where you can only have one bullet on screen at the same time, which would give the game a, a retro feel, I think. Um, but it just requires a little bit of pivoting in the code, and the behavior is really obvious in both cases. Um, but the thing that underpins being able to split apart behaviors as different tasks uh, is cancellation. So um, any nursery, in fact, so the, in fact, the primitive that could be canceled is called a cancellation scope, and a nursery contains a cancellation scope. So here we're creating uh, a ship object with a nursery, um, and when a uh, the the code at the bottom is a separate task that is running collision detection. And when the enemy ship collides with a bullet, we just cancel that nursery. Um, and cancellation means that uh, an exception is thrown inside every task. And when all of the tasks have finished, um, the exceptions have propagated such that the, uh, they've all finished, then the con flow continues outside of the nursery block. And that means that the explosion effects here that will play, that's a, a graphical explosion effect and a sound effect. Um, so the collision causes the death of the, the ship and the ship's code can react to its death. But also, outer cancellation implies inner cancellation. If you had a nursery, the nursery that is running your task would will imply, if that is canceled, then it uh, cancels the task within your nursery and your nursery. So uh, going back to the model of tasks as a tree, you can cancel at any point and flow returns to that point. Um, and all of the, that tree is collapsed and thrown away. So here, um, the bottom coroutine is running 
the entire player's existence. It's giving the player three lives. And then after the, those three lives are up, it's going to cancel the nursery, and that's going to cancel the, uh, the level as well. So game over. Uh, we go back to wave one. Um, so returning to the ship then, there are two ways out of this function. Uh, remember we were awaiting at the exit of the nursery, um, and we either are cancelled in this scope, in which case flow, the flow continues afterwards and we'll play the explosion effects, or the entire level is thrown away, at which point an exception is, is raised at that point, and flow doesn't continue. Um, and that means that we can start using things like context managers. Um, so here there are a couple of context managers to show the ship sprite uh, on the screen and delete it afterwards um, and to turn on collision detection. And both of those are turned off regardless of how the, uh, the, this coroutine exits. So, um, oh, I was going to say more there of sync with my slides on here. Um, <coughs> so um, this, is, this is really important. This, this be became really compelling. Um, in games that I've written without structured concurrency or concurrency as a paradigm, cleanup is, was really, really hard um, and uh, buggy and because the state is everywhere. Um, so we can cancel by throwing things away and we can use context managers when we're doing it. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the synchronization problems or uh, the, the, the par parallels between uh, synchronization in games and synchronization in I.O. Um, so there's another example video here from Axiom. Oh, what's that? Can you take that away, please? Who's at the desk? The speaker notes have popped up on the... Okay, I'm, I'll, I'll just talk through it a little bit. Um, what you're going to see is uh, an example of a uh, play in which there is a repair drone um, and there is an iris door which will open to let out the repair drones. Um, and also, I'm also going to be picking up power ups. Uh, we're back from there, backwards. Yeah, I'm get back to it. Okay, cool. So I'm picking up power-ups. Um, the power-up building factory things is going to start building another power-up. Keep your eye on the iris opening and closing to let drones in and out. Oh, cool. Um, I can move on from there. So this is achieved through event objects, which are a thing in uh, Trio as well as Wasabi 2D. Um, and they allow tasks to communicate not by cancel. So cancellation just seems to be a concurrency primitive as well. But if you don't have anything that you actually want to cancel, here we want generate power ups to continue running. And it's an infinite loop. It's going to um, uh, do the build up to create a new power up. It will create one and set an event that it hasn't been collected yet. And then it's going to wait, wait for that event. So wait for that power up to be collected. Then turn off the lights when it is collected and do it all again. And uh, we use set in the collision handling to uh, initiate that event. Um, and the iris turned out to be really satisfying when I actually implemented this code because uh, I thought this was going to be really hard to write, and it turned out to be really easy. Um, I needed two coroutine, uh, two um, uh, event objects, and I had to make the iris control its own coroutine. So uh, you can imagine, like, there's a program running on that spaceship, um, and it is uh, waiting for a request to open the iris. Um, and when the iris is open, it signals and everything that's waiting to go through it that it is open. Um, and then it waits for a second and times out and closes the iris again. Um, and the function open iris there uh, requests the iris to open and uh, waits for it to be opened. And that dropped out very nicely. 
so why would I write Trio in my game engine when Trio is a thing? Um, so, oh. Okay, that slide has moved. Um, <coughs> oh, maybe come back to that. Uh, one reason is that we're waiting at different points. Um, so in Trio, we're waiting on I.O., so we're waiting for a file descriptor to be ready, and the call to do that is a select-like thing or a selector. And in Pygame, we're waiting for input events um, or a timeout. So in both cases, we, we maintain a clock, uh, which is the next thing that we need to wake up for anyway. Um, but the, we're using different functions to drive the, uh, as the point that we block the entire thread. Um, and we could combine those two, maybe. We could run two threads, and we could pass uh, events between one and the other, and it would be, it would work, but it would be a little bit clumsy. Um, but there was a deeper issue, which is that when multiple tasks are ready to run, we have to have some opinion on which order they run in. Like you can't just not have an opinion. You have to pick one and run it. Um, so which we, we run, the, the one that's waiting longest or uh, the highest priority task, if you had priorities? And there's no right answer. It just depends what you're trying to optimize for. So here, Trio and Wasabi 2D diverge. Uh, Trio currently just picks a task at random, uh, which doesn't necessarily optimize for anything. But uh, Nathaniel justifies that as avoiding users having any expectations of, of what it's optimizing for so that he can change it later. Um, Wasabi 2D always runs the earliest created task first. So um, it's a deterministic ordering um, that prior well, prioritizes determinism. And that's because if you picked at random, a task could be scheduled at the end of one frame and the start of another frame. And then it's not seen a whole frame's worth of changes in the rest of the world. Um, so we want it to see approximately one frame's worth of changes every time. Um, the order um, then uh, might be relevant, but at least we, we don't have the jitter to deal with. But our ideas of time uh, diverge as well. So in Trio, we have an idea of continuous time. So, um, or a, 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 a normal time, <laughs> and I'm calling it continuous here. Uh, every time you ask the clock for, for what time it is, it will tell you a different time. Uh, time will move on. And we could schedule frames every 60th of a second, but I'd be worried about a task being suspended into the next frame when it absolutely had to happen in, in, the, in the first frame. Uh, so we have a, a model of time where it, it's a, a discrete model where time doesn't move forward within a frame. We have a bundle of stuff that has to run, and all of it has to be run before we can say, OK, we're done. We can draw a frame. Um, and the clock will just return the same time within that unit of time. Um, so summing up, um, uh, in games programming, structured concurrency lets us split behaviors into multiple coroutines. Um, and ca uh, cancellation seems to be the important thing uh, for implementing this. Um, and code seems easier to write because as we saw, behaviors are more simply stated. We can have more of them, uh, and they can do independent things, even though they're acting on the same objects. Uh, there is a slight shift in focus, uh, which is that exceptions are pretty unimportant for uh, Wasabi 2D. Exceptions cause cancellation, but um, exceptions in a game are probably uh, they're, they're less expected than if you're dealing with I.O. Like, uh, um, it's more likely to indicate a bug in your game logic. Um, so Wasabi 2D doesn't bother with handling multiple exceptions or exception groups. Um, so all of this led to a model that practically eliminated state keeping up bugs in a game. Um, and it was very easy to add more animations. And animations are good in games because they add graphical richness. Um, and um, uh, you know, every every time that you the world changes, you want to have the 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 player see that as juicy as this this model of uh, uh, games programming, where you you're trying to keep the player engaged. Um, 
And avoiding a global nursery using structured concurrency helps make code refactorable because you can always call a coroutine function from another or you can pivot your entire program um, because uh, they, you know, they're, they're guaranteed to be self-contained tasks. So thank you. This is all on GitHub. Um, the coroutine stuff hasn't, is, is on the master branch and it's documented. Um, but I'm still working my way up to a release. I've got kids now, so yes, I have less time to play with this stuff. Um, Axiom is on the PyWeek website, um, and PyWeek is at pyweek.org. Um, so you know, maybe you could join us for the next competition, which will be in September. Thanks very much.